Hey guys and welcome to lecture number two of week five. We're gonna pick up right where we stopped with functions and try to analyze what continuity in function in functions means and take a look at a very important theorem which is called the mean value theorem. Now for a quick outline. Um, first of all, we will talk about what continuity means, get a grip of the intuition of the concept, and then we will shift to a more mathematical type of definition where we will define a precise tool which will tell us is a function continuous or not, regardless of what our intuition is, we will have a tool which mathematically models this concept. And then in the end, we will talk about the mean value theorem, how it utilizes continuity and what it means for mathematics. All right, let's dive in. So the first question is, what is our intuition with continuity? Um, I'll take you to take a look at the following three functions or at the graphs of the following three functions um, and get an impression of what do you think, which one of these is continuous or not. I would expect you to have pretty strong feelings for the first two and then maybe be a bit uncertain for the last one. What I can tell you is that your intuition is probably correct. Or it's maybe a weird way to talk about correct or incorrect since we are trying to quantify our intuition. So it's kind of the intuition that we're talking about. It's not that we try to line up our intuition with the math, but we try to line up the math with our intuition. So yes, uh, the first function is obviously a continuous one, and the second one is obviously not continuous, right? There, there's a jump. Having jumps between values is what we feel like is um, not continuous. And then for the third function, there is not a continuous line going through the graph, but we do have some infinity issues there, like, right? It's not just a simple jump, but things go off to infinity, and this is complicating things. But um, first things first, let's now try to find a quantifiable expression to talk about this. The general idea is that we have two differences. We have the difference in the domain and in the image. So our goal is that if the two elements in our domain, let's say the two elements A and B, um, get arbitrarily close, we want the functional values to become arbitrarily close as well. So this, or we could, of course, talk about it the other way around. If um, the difference between f of a and f of b becomes arbitrarily small, fixed arbitrarily small, then we want a and b to be arbitrarily close together. And um, this is, of course, kind of a difficult thing to quantify, right? Um, you're looking at the graph of a function, you're like, what the hell? How, how is this... Um, gonna 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 solve um because what does arbitrarily close mean right like what is close enough we can't just say all right if if the differences are always smaller than 0.1 then um we're good to go right this is continuous no right we have to have a rigorous definition where any small tiny jump which is a real jump has to be called not continuous and just smooth things no matter how steep they are, should be called continuous. Um, but since every single tiny jump between A and B, where A and B are different numbers, is not zero, it's difficult to prove. Um, and in order to do so, we will go back to sequences and limits of sequences, and we will borrow this idea of a small, arbitrarily small, but positive epsilon, which always has to be fulfilled. And we will use the same concept as with sequences in order to define continuity. So um, here is the formal definition of the epsilon delta criterion. Here we are adding an additional Greek letter, delta, because in our function example, we don't have just one value that has to get arbitrarily small the limit in sequences, we have two values. We have to have the difference between two values um, in the domain and the two values in the image. 
So um, the definition goes as follows. So we take um, the function f and we call it continuous if for any epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero such that the functional values between a and a plus delta are closer together than epsilon. And the function itself is called continuous as this is true for all a and x. In a more simpler case, we would say that f is continuous in a if this property is true for just one single value of a. Um, now, what does this mean? Um, I've put it into a more colloquial um, expression. So um, a function is continuous if no matter how close together we push the functional values, we can always squeeze the domain as well so that it works. So the idea is we look, we look at the function and we say, all right, we want all functional values, all image values to be as close together as 0 0.001. And it is continuous to, to this degree if we can squeeze our delta so much that no matter where in the function we are, if we take a, an element of the domain and then that element plus delta, the functional values are closer together than 0 0.001. So then we would say that um, the function is continuous to the degree of 0 0.001. And if we say this for an arbitrary epsilon, so no matter how small epsilon gets, no matter how small the difference of the functional values gets, if we get a delta as small as we like, such that um, our domain values are really close to each other, then we call it continuous. We call it continuous if we can pick any number epsilon, and for any number epsilon there is an appropriate delta for it to fulfill our condition. I have an example here. We have the functions on before. On the left hand side, we have the continuous x squared function. So if you want an epsilon, which is as big as the one I have indicated, then you have to pick the delta as large as um, indicated on the y axis. And if you wanted a, sm wanted a smaller epsilon, then you, you would have to make delta even smaller. Um, on the right hand side, we see a non-continuous function. So um, on the right hand side, we see that no matter how small we make epsilon, delta between zero and one will always stay one. And if you want to have a smaller delta than that, well, it just, it doesn't work, right? It collides. Okay, now let's show this in an analytical mathematical way. Um, in the previous picture, we had the non-continuous function f of x equals zero for x is um, less or equal to zero, and we have f of x equals one for x is greater than one. This is just the um, function underlying the graph we just saw on the right-hand side. And the theorem is that this is not continuous. So the cool part is if something is not continuous, if function is not continuous, this means it's not continuous for every single value in the domain. This means if it's not continuous, it suffices to show that there is one domain value for which it is not continuous. Um, and let's assume that this value is zero. So um, f of zero is zero. And well, let's just pick f of x to be zero. Then um, we pick an epsilon. Let's, let's pick it a half right? In order for a theorem to work, any epsilon has to go. L literally every single epsilon has to work. But if we find one where it doesn't work, we've already disproven it. So let's just pick a half. Um, now given that epsilon is a half, we need to find a delta such that our criterion is met, that the difference between f of zero and f of zero plus delta is smaller than epsilon. However, delta is bigger than zero. And given our definition, the f of anything bigger than zero is one. So f of zero minus f of one, the absolute value of which is one. This means that this can never be smaller than epsilon. But for continuity, 
we would require this expression to be smaller than epsilon. And since it can't be smaller than epsilon, or smaller or equal to epsilon, um, we have thus disproven continuity, we have proven discontinuity. This is, I would say, fairly simple, since we can directly show that the criterion for continuity is not met at one point. However, it becomes quite difficult when you have to show that something is continuous, because if you have to show that something is continuous, you have to show it for every single domain value. And you can't just test out an infinite number of domain values. You have to find a way to systematically fill everything. And for this, there's a um, quite handy theorem, I would say. Uh, we're not going to prove it here. There's um, plenty of proofs of it um, on the internet. You can look it up if it interests you, but it's not really relevant. So the theorem is the following. If we have two functions f and g and they're both continuous, then we can do whatever we like to them between each other, any sort of arithmetic calculation, and the resulting functions will as well be continuous. For example, f plus g always continuous, f times g always continuous, and the concatenation of f and g is also continuous. This means we take f of g of x. And on top, if g has no zero values in its image, then even the quotient of the two, so f divided by two by g is still continuous. Okay, why am I stressing that g is not allowed to have any zero values? Well, do you remember our initial function, which ran away to positive and negative infinity at some point around x equals minus two and two? Um, this was one such case where we divide one function by another and at the point where the denominator becomes zero, well, our values just run off to infinity, right? Because define, dividing by zero runs off to infinity. It has no defined value. And at this point, um, an important question has to be asked, which is, does the val is the value for which our function goes off to infinity included in the domain or not? Imagine we have to function one over x. Then the crucial question for whether it is continuous or not is if the value zero is in the domain or not. Do we have the domain of the real numbers or the real numbers without zero? And if it's the real numbers without zero, then it is continuous. But if it's the real numbers as a whole, then there is this one value zero, which is not continuous because it's not defined. And then the function is not continuous anymore. So it's kind of a special case, an odd case, but it's good to know about it. So let's just look at our second example, right? Um, you remember the graph? It was x squared, which is just the squared polynomial. And our theorem is that this is a continuous function. If you look at the graph, it looks continuous, right? Just how do we go about proving it, right? We can't just look at every single point of x squared in the real numbers and check if it's continuous. So we're gonna use a little trick. We're gonna use the identity function. I hope you remember it from last week. Um, the identity function just maps an element to itself. So i of x equals x. And we'll show that it is continuous because, well, if we pick any epsilon greater than zero, we can just pick delta equal to epsilon. And then, well, if we plug this into our definition, we just compute f of a minus f of a plus delta. Well, this is just a minus a plus delta, which is equal to delta. And since delta is equal to epsilon, it is also less or equal to epsilon. Mm. This means that identity function is continuous. And now remember the theorem on the previous slide. If we just take f of x and multiply it by f of x, uh, excuse me, assume we take i of x and multiply it with i of x, we just get x squared. And we can get, in fact, any polynomial just by multiplying identities and constants. And thus, every single polynomial, including x squared, is continuous. That way, we can easily prove it for every, sing for every single function of this type. All right, I hope you got through the lecture well so far. This is, I guess, kind of intuitive stuff, stuff you already kind of had in your guts when talking about functions but it is really important to 
stick to the mathematical rules and know how to prove it accurately and rigorously. Now, to the last point of the lecture, we're going to talk about the mean value theorem, a very important theorem when starting to build up calculus and um, discussions about functions. So um, this is basically a simple logical leap. And for those more interested in deeper mathematics, proving this theorem is quite a cool exercise, but of course this completely smashes the scope of the course. So um, imagine we have two, two numbers, a and b, and we take their values, f of a and f of b. And uh, let's say a is smaller than b and f of a is smaller than f of b. Then this means that somehow there has to be a graph between f of a and f of b. And this graph, if it is continuous, has to, well, make a path without ever lifting the pen. This means that every single value between f of a and f of b has to be hit at some point because they're all in between, right? If you go up from f of a to f of b, there is no point we can not cross in order to arrive. So the mathematically formulated theorem is let f be a continuous function with a smaller than b in the domain. Then if we take a value x in the interval between f of a and f of b, there must be a c in between a and b such that f of c equals x. In order to visualize this, I have a graphic for you. So look at the values a and b. Um, our underlying function is this cubic function right here. And if you take the value at a, it's the value f of a, and if you take the value of b, it's the value f of b. These are the um, green lines here in the image. And now the point is, if you pick any value between the green horizontal lines, here in this example, it is the value of u. Then there must be a c value, which is um, the orange red one, which is located between the vertical values a and b, just because the graph has to reach from f of a to f of b. Um, I hope this builds an intuition for you why this always has to hold. Uh, question, of course, being, what is this good for? Well, in calculus, one of the main problems we're going to worry about um, will be the zero values of functions. When is f of x equal to zero? For what x is that the case? And the mean value theorem tells us that if a is above zero and b is below zero or vice versa this means that in between them granted that the function is continuous there must be a zero value because in order to get from negative to positive or vice versa you have to cross that zero line and we even know how to approximate the zero value we learned about the babylonian method like two weeks ago i think and we can now use the Babylonian method to approximate the zero values. How do we do this? Well, we do everything we learned, but we are now not comparing the mean value of our intervals that we're halving with um, the number we're going for, but we're comparing them to zero. And we look in which two of our two sub-intervals is zero located, and we pick that one. And thus we get smaller and smaller intervals until we get arbitrarily close to a zero. Um, of course, very important to note, just because um, we know that between A and B there is a zero, this doesn't mean that there has to be exactly one. There can be arbitrarily many. We only know that there is at least one and that the number is odd. Because, I mean, if you have two of them, let's say um, A is positive and B is negative, then we cross the line from A to get negative, and then we cross it to get X to positive. But B is negative, so we have to cross it once more. So uh, we know that in that case we have an odd number of zeros, but at least one. And if we apply the Babylonian method, we just get an arbitrary one of these zero values, so we can't really control which one it is. Okay, 
so we went um, through all the things continuity and mean value theorem, and I hope you got everything so far and have no questions. Um, just a little recap. So the main takeaways here were the epsilon delta criterion for defining continuity, the fact that general continuity for a function is kind of difficult to prove, but can be built up by taking simple functions that are easy to prove for continuity and then using them to concatenate them or to multiply them with one another in order to get to more complicated functions, which then by definition are also continuous. And the mean value theorem, which is a very important theorem in calculus, tells us about the in-between values between two functional values if a function is continuous, and it helps us in identifying zeros if we have no arithmetic way of calculating them. Thank you for listening, and the next chapter, Leo, will continue on an introduction to differential calculus. He will introduce you to derivatives and what the change rate of a function means and how to compute it. Um, also, if you look at the courseware section, you will see that we've added a small block into every chapter that says uh, comments, questions, or remarks, where if you have any remarks, um, anything, some, some, something is explained very badly or you can't understand, um, or you just have a suggestion, any type of feedback, whatever, if it's nothing dire and you don't have to email or text us, just leave it there and um, we will read through it and try to work it into our next lectures. Thank you for listening and see you next time.